This podcast is brought to you by Aetna. Learn how Aetna is working to build a healthier world by visiting aetnastory.com. Dora, have you given any thought as to how you want to bring in 2020? I can't believe it's so close that the year is coming to an end and we're coming into a new year. Yes, we're hosting in partnership with the Gasparilla Inn a wellness experience on January 27th in Boca Grande, Florida. What's going to happen down there? We're going to be doing cooking demonstrations. We're going to be walking on the beach. We're going to be doing yoga every morning. We're going to be learning from world-class teachers on how to take better care of ourselves. I mean, it's just going to be amazing. So go to our website, bbrconsulting.us, to learn more and to sign up. And we look forward to seeing you on January 27th. Can't wait to see you all there. People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Dr. Dina Tapscott specializes in functional medicine, adult holistic primary care, and obesity medicine. She believes that it's not enough to diagnose a disease or to treat a symptom without understanding the root cause. Testing beyond the conventional labs helps her to address nutritional, metabolic, genetic, and hormonal optimization. Tapscott believes that everyone has a life story that influences their health. Please welcome Dr. Dina Tapscott to Health Gig. Well, thank you for inviting me. So my story sort of begins in 2014, and that's when I was unfortunately diagnosed with breast cancer. At the time, I was healthy. I didn't have any risk factors. So I started to question, well, why? You know, why do I have breast cancer? It makes no sense. I was practicing conventional medicine at the time. So I went through some conventional treatments, surgery and chemotherapy. But along the way, I continued to ask why. And it ultimately led me to the Institute of Functional Medicine. Through my interactions with that educational process, I better understood what was actually going on with my health. And it sort of explained why I ended up with breast cancer. And it's not the conventional. A lot of it is sort of the stress and some estrogen issues. So after being with the Institute of Functional Medicine, I learned that this is sort of how I should be practicing. It sort of made sense, this way of approaching patient care. And so like The Matrix, the movie with Keanu Reeves, I said, you know, once I stepped out of The Matrix, I couldn't go back. And so from that point on, I went into the functional medicine space. And what is functional medicine? Functional medicine is the way of taking care of chronic conditions. So we think about You know, one in two Americans has actually a chronic condition. So things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, things like dementia, even gastrointestinal conditions, cancers, of course, autoimmune disease. These are chronic conditions. And one in two of us, me being one of them, has a chronic condition. And functional medicine's goal is to address these chronic conditions. The approach we take in functional medicine is very root cause. We look for the underlying cause or causes of conditions, as opposed to the sort of the conventional medicine, which is a little bit more, if you have a symptom, we treat it with a medication. Functional medicine dives deeper. We look at the whole patient, sort of optimal wellness as opposed to just being disease-free. So as an example, the diagnosis of depression. A lot of us have depression. We have symptoms of depression. If you meet enough criteria, your doctor says, you have depression. You know, here's a medication. It's very linear. Here's your symptom. Here's your pill. Functional medicine says, you know what? Why do you have these symptoms of depression? Maybe it's related to nutritional deficiencies, which affect the gut microbiome, which affects the ability to make neurotransmitters. All of this is related to mood disorders. Or maybe it's a sleep problem. Maybe it's too much nutrients. Maybe it's related to hormonal imbalances. So functional medicine delves deeper and tries to understand what are the real root causes of these conditions. I would imagine you need to, as a functional medicine doctor, need to have a patient that's rather engaged, somebody that's open to want to hear this and also wants to be your partner as opposed to your patient. Is that true? It is true. And the patients that come to me are very educated. They're very aware of their conditions. And many of them have tried other things. I mean, I'd like to get people to use functional medicine as the first doctor that they see, but oftentimes it's sort of other things didn't work, so I'm coming to see you. 
most of our patients, they really are involved. And if they're not, then we explain to them that the majority of your condition is related to lifestyle factors. And so we call them personal modifiable lifestyle factors like, you know, are you getting enough sleep? Is it adequate? What's your nutrient status? Are you getting too much of something not enough? You know, what is your stress level? Are you sleeping well? And then, you know, what are your relationships like? I mean, these are things that happen once they leave the office. Can we talk a little bit about weight loss? Something I struggle with, I think a lot of people do. Why are we resistant to weight loss and how does a functional approach weight loss? So there's something called resistant weight loss and we call it that because it's not the conventional, I'm eating too much, I'm not exercising, which is sort of what people think is the only reason why people have a hard time losing weight. Now, I've been doing bariatric medicine, medical weight loss since after residency. What's it called? Bariatric medicine, Uh, which is, it's not the surgery, it's a medical approach to weight loss. And we focus a lot on lifestyle factors, but what I have found is that's not enough. And for many people who are eating right, they're exercising, they're managing their stress, they still have difficulties. And so we start to delve deeper, hence the functional medicine approach. And we start to say, well, maybe it's related to hormonal imbalances, especially postmenopausal women. Maybe there's estrogen excess because you're not detoxifying, and that plays a role. Maybe there are nutritional deficiencies. Once again, nutrients play a significant role. We also think of things like toxins. I mean, It's not a common thought, but toxins are things that accumulate over time. So, for example, in women, there's a lot of makeup and hair and, you know, skincare products that ultimately over time build up. The body is smart. It says, you know, these toxins are not good. They will adversely affect the organs. So what are we going to do about it? Well, let's store these toxins in fat. And so there are ways to assess, you know, maybe an individual is having a hard time losing weight because they have these toxic buildup. So the functional medicine approach looks at some of these resistant, these explanations that are not so common as related to weight loss. Wow. If that's not an advertisement for using natural products, I don't know Mm. what is. I didn't know that it got stored in fat. That's fascinating. What about the term diabetes? Because the rates of diabetes and obesity are sort of going along the same trajectory, I don't know who came up with it, but it makes sense. And so the approach for weight loss fortunately benefits the diabetes as well as the approach to diabetes benefits weight loss because the underlying mechanisms are very similar, sort of insulin resistance. And so when we take care of patients who have diabetes, obesity, or combination, the approach we take is very integrated. Diet is a big factor, but we also look at other variables that I mentioned that can play a role in their weight problems. Weight problems, I mean, could we call that a chronic disease? Obesity and overweight is actually classified as a chronic disease now because of its medical-related problems. And so that's why they're saying that, what, 4 in 10 adults have more than 2 or 3 chronic diseases. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. That actually puts you in this position to now, if I'm overweight, I'm now possibly at a higher risk for diabetes and a higher risk for heart disease and a higher risk for, okay. Yeah, and these are the chronic conditions that we're talking about. And so, you know, as you can imagine, you can't just go to your doctor and say, these are my concerns and the doctor's like, here's a pill because there's so many variables that play a role in the conditions that patients are presenting with, like diabetes. How does a functional doctor talk about BMI? So when we talk about BMI or body mass index, it's a number that we give based off of a person's anthropometric measurements. We use it in research more so than anything because that's how we decide what are the BMIs that are associated with X, Y, and Z medical problems. But I think it's probably more important to look at the patient and say, less so the BMI, to be honest, even less so the weight and really assess the overall patient. I mean, the waist circumference is relevant. We can't measure the amount of what we call visceral fat, which is the fat that lines the organs. So we use the waist circumference as a marker for the amount of visceral fat, which is the fat of more concern. But there are a lot of different factors when you're looking at a patient when you're doing an exam that are relevant to their overall health. Can you tell us about visceral fat? I mean, it's fascinating how it has its own, like, (laughs) it's like its own world in there, right? 
Especially postmenopausal. Yeah. Okay. For, like we're sitting here <laughs> yeah. holding our visceral fat right now. <laughs> visceral fat. You know, we think about the waist circumference. Once again, is relevant to cardiovascular disease. But you know, when we think about visceral fat, especially that's the fat around the waist, or even just weight gain in the midsection. You know, yes, it could be visceral fat. But one thing we actually find out: there's a lot of bloating. There's a lot of activity going on inside the intestinal tract, which may present itself as I'm gaining weight in the midsection, but come to find out it's actually related to gastrointestinal issues and bloating. So it's not just a woman's issue. I mean, men have visceral fat. Well, men have a lot of visceral Yeah, they fat. have a lot of visceral <laughs> Yeah, it kind of goes there. It's as they the get. tire that they get. Yeah. And it's important. I mean, that's a good marker. You know, when women and men start to notice, especially men because they pay attention to their belt size, when that starts to increase and they're noticing, you know, larger and larger waist circumferences, in this case, the belt size goes up, that's a good marker for maybe something's going on. And it's not just a fat thing. It's a cardiovascular thing. It's a risk. And so we can use that as a guide to say, I need to start to intervene. Do you advocate one diet over another? Actually, there is no perfect diet, which is why there's so much controversy. But if you look at the diets that are out there, they all have the same similar theme. It's sort of eating what your grandmother and great-grandmother ate, eating real food, whole food, grass-fed animals, making sure you're getting in good, healthy fats, which are sort of the avocados and nuts and seeds, you know, making sure you're getting a lot of colorful vegetables because that's where the phytonutrients come in. Those are the chemicals that actually help benefit, you know, our bodies. If you look across the board, they're all advocating the same thing. Now, whether you add animals, you know, that's sort of controversy. But, you know, really it's all about, you know, healthy, clean eating. And what makes you feel good, right? I mean, if you're eating what's good for you, then you do feel good, right? I mean, I think you can all kind of identify with Eventually. that. Eventually. Now, some people feel good with sugar and sodas and wine and, you know. But I think in the end, when they change, when people who eat a lot of sugar, when they start to decrease that and start eating healthier, they do ultimately feel better because sugar is sort of a temporary high. I'm a sugar person. So sugar is a big part of my life. So it's a constant. And I do feel addicted to sugar. Can you talk about that? And is that a real thing? It's interesting because some of our behaviors are actually in some part, determined by what's going on in our microbiome. And I brought that up before. I mean, the gut microbiome, we're learning a lot about that. It's sort of an ecosystem in and of itself. And so some things that we think about is some of our behaviors actually are determined by what is living there and not living there. So if we have what they call gut dysbiosis, which is an abnormality, it's not the right type of bacteria. There's an imbalance there. That can play a role. There's, it's called the gut-brain connection. And so maybe that behavior is driven by some of the things that are growing. And so I think you should come and get a stool analysis. And then that way through the stool analysis, what does that tell you? Well, we look at the microbiome in depth. And the then, microbiome is your gut and it's like all the flora in there? Exactly. It's sort of the ecosystem that sort of runs the show. There's trillions of bacteria, worms, protozoa even fungi and yeast, they live there and they talk to each other, they talk to us. And so through its communication, they can actually dictate a lot of our behaviors. And you were talking about the gut-brain connection. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that does affect your moods? Once again, when patients come in, for example, with a diagnosis of depression, we start to say, well, you know, could this be related to this gut-brain axis problem? Could this be the ecosystem, the microbiome playing a role? And so the whole gut, brain, and even just the microbiome, it's a fairly new field that we're learning a lot about because there's just a lot that we can do to manipulate the microbiome, which then in turn can affect our health as a whole. How do you get rid of the bacteria you don't want in your gut? Well, the first thing is to find out what's there and what's not there. And the approach that we take is not conventional, like we're not giving antibiotics to kill. It's usually sort of a chronic process. And so we use antimicrobials, that's one thing, which are herbal preparations that can alter the microbiome. But we also change how we eat. A lot of 
the microbiome, of course, is determined by what we feed them. So if we're feeding these bacteria and organisms good stuff, we call them prebiotics, mostly vegetables, then they're going to grow the way they're supposed to. And so, you know, creating that better balance is very comprehensive, but a lot of it is dictated by what we feed them. You know, one thing that we wanted to talk to you about, and I think you're almost talking about it now, is food is medicine. And what you were just saying is prebiotics are a lot of vegetables, like artichokes. Can you explore that with us? What other kind of strong prebiotics are there? Mostly, when you think of prebiotics, you want to think of colorful vegetables. In fact, when you think of your general health, you want to say, what am I not getting in? We're always talking about don't eat this, don't eat that. But more importantly, we have to say, what are you not getting in? So I recommend everybody, you know, when you go to the grocery store, every time you go, just pick up a new vegetable that you've never had and try it. You know, if nothing else, you can always stir fry it with stuff that you do like. But, you know, adding color to your diet is going to be important. And there's actually a field called nutrigenomics, studying how these nutrients actually modify and turn on and off genes and gene expression. Because we know that food changes how our body functions. I mean, anti-inflammatory nutrients like, from a cardiovascular standpoint, we'll recommend, like I mentioned, the healthy fats, things like turmeric, which is a spice. You know, these are foods that actually decrease the inflammation, which inflammation is basically the underlying cause of most chronic conditions. So food talks to our cells, which changes what happens with our bodies. Things like seaweed, which my kids do like. Mm -hmm. Seaweed has things like vitamin C. It has iodine in it. This seaweed actually has been shown in research to help fight cancer, improve the immune system. So we can use food, and we should use food as medicine as opposed to using medicines, at least as a first line. Seaweed salad, they make a really good one at Raku. But I was but, also thinking about seaweed crackers. Are those okay if they're cooked? I mean, how do you feel about, like, cooked seaweed? I think it's okay. My kids like the ones that are just like little strips of seaweed, right. like dried seaweed. The dried yes. seaweed, like nor or something mm-hmm. like that, yeah. You mentioned healthy fats. You know, we've been programmed in the past to avoid fats, but we know that, especially as some of us are going to be 60 soon, that we need to be eating a lot of healthy fats. So can you talk about that? The research now supports the fact that fat, number one, does not make you fat. Fat is not a contributing factor to cardiovascular disease. It's sugar. Sugar is the enemy. Carbohydrates, the enemy for the most part. So we need fat. I mean, the cells are made up of fat. Our brain is full of fat. We need healthy fats. There's a great book by Dr. Mark Hyman. It's called Food, What the Heck Should I Eat? And it's a deep dive into, you know, the details of nutrition and specific foods. But all fat is not the same. So we're not talking about trans fats. We're really talking about foods like grass-fed beef or grass-fed meat. We're talking about fish. And these are specific types of fish. So when we encourage the use of fish, They're called smash fish, which is an abbreviation for salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. And these are fish that are low in mercury because they're smaller, because the larger fish are going to have more mercury. And they also have a lot of omega-3, which is sort of the nutrient that we're trying to get to decrease inflammation and improve health. How about taking fish oil? Do you think that's important? There are a few vitamins that I think are almost essential. Everybody should probably be on them. Of course, you know, talking to your doctor to make sure there's no reasons why you can't. But one of them is going to be vitamin D because many of us have deficiencies. And the browner you are, the less you absorb through the sun. And we're not getting enough sun exposure. I don't see any windows around here. So, you know, vitamin D is especially in certain times of the year. Also, omega-3 is important. Once again, it's an anti-inflammatory and our diets just don't have enough of it. And then probably a good multivitamin, multimineral. I mean, I think it's unfortunate, but even if you're eating healthy and whole foods based, it's still growing in soil that is depleted. So taking a good multivitamin, multimineral is important. When you talk about health exams and true health exams, can you tell us how you look at it differently? So if Dora and I came into your office, what would that exam be? The true health exam, I thought about it as patients were coming to me and and friends were coming to me with sort of these, all of a sudden I woke up with diabetes or my doctor told me I had this disease. And it's as if they had nothing before. And so what I found is that a lot of people are walking around, they're not as healthy as they think they are. And it's unfortunate, but they'll go to their doctor 
they'll have a routine exam. They have some basic labs done. And then, you know, everything checks out. Maybe your mammogram, colonoscopy, you know, you've had those types of preventive tests. But unfortunately, it's not enough, especially for adults. So when patients come to me, we're going to do a deeper dive. And it starts with, number one, just the history itself. You know, we start from what happened in utero. So we're talking about were you vaginal delivery, were you breastfed, because that establishes your microbiome early on. We talk about what were your exposures, you know, were you on acne medicines, did you start taking birth control early on. All of these things, they seem like, well, I'm an adult, what does it have to do with where I am now? But it has everything to do with sort of who you are and your health concerns. So we really delve deep into that history, along with looking at those personal modifiable lifestyle factors. And then with that information, number two, we say, well, what kind of tests are relevant for you? And it's not just TSH level for your thyroid. It's, well, is this optimal? Are your levels optimal? Not within normal limits, but are they optimal? We'll also look at things like the microbiome. We'll look at nutrients at a deeper level. Once we put all that information together, then we say, okay, now what plan do we have for you? What nutrients do you need? What maybe additional testing do you need? And then how can we address those lifestyle factors? Yeah, you're really looking at everybody as an individual. And also what I think you shared with us too before is that the body is like a river. It can heal, right? It can take care of itself if it's given the right ingredients. Exactly. And, you know, too often we rely on someone else or something else to fix us. What we try to emphasize in functional medicine is that, you know, you're in control. You just need the knowledge to create the optimal wellness But, you know, you're in control and the body can heal. And our goal is to help the process along. That makes so much sense. It really does to allow the body to have everything it needs to find homeostasis. We ask all of our guests, what is their favorite book? What would you tell all of our listeners that you want them to read? I think Dr. Mark Hyman's book is really good. I think because food is so important and there's a lot of myths about what we should eat and what we shouldn't eat, at this point, I think, you know, I would recommend that, you know, people read. It's an easy read, but read that book to really understand what you can do. And what's the name of that book? Food, What the Heck Should I Eat? And do you have a favorite quote by any chance that you live by as a cancer survivor? Is there anything that kind of got you through that period? My philosophy on life, I suppose, is that everything happens as it's supposed to. There are no mistakes. You may not understand it at the time, because if you had asked me in 2014, what's the good in this, I would not be able to answer it. But now, and in retrospect, you know, I would not have gotten to functional medicine. I would not have found this love if I had not been diagnosed with breast cancer. So it happened for a reason, and now I know why. Dr. Denia Tapska, where can people find you? We're online at NiaDC.com and then the social media arena at Dina Tapscott. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on HealthGigPod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well. <laughs>